S-I-N, self-induced nonsense. Uh, While well, the world calls it sin, where you're going to hell if you violate God's statutes or ordinances. I mean, you know, that there's something that happened at the cross that got rid of that, that fear of eternal death. I mean, because we don't have it anymore. We've been given eternal life. If you study the scriptures correctly, you've been afforded the luxury of never having to even think about hell. But it's a scare tactic that a lot of religious people like to use because they like to keep you scared and in the seats and your wallet wide open. Trust me, I don't know, I was there. Uh, you know, they used to use people to come in sometimes and do all the pastor's dirty work and talk to us like we were the most rotten scoundrels in the world and in the end take all the offering and then the pastor would give him half just because he was able to say the things the pastor was tired of saying. That's just the way it goes. You know, it's kind of shady tactics, but it happens, amen. So I'm not here to be the policeman for the body of Christ, but I am here to advise you on accuracy. So we want you to be... You know, accurate. Now, if you ever travel out of Hilo and go attend some of your family members' churches, or even in Hilo, if you're brave enough to walk into another church just to hear, I'll tell you, you hear some stuff, bro. Yeah, you hear some stuff. Ah, you know what? I, because we record everything, we don't edit anything. I'm, if you notice, I'm not careful about what I say. I just say it because that's the truth. I'm accountable for what I teach. These guys will be accountable for what they teach. Now, I'm not saying that we're all going to get to heaven and God's going to start smashing people's faces in. I'm just saying that, you know, there's going to be big segments of people that aren't going to be too pleased. When you got to go, the, in the Old Testament, it says that, you know, you, you wear either a robe of righteousness or a gown of salvation. Now, everybody gets saved, right? You want to wear the white gown with the white rope thing tied around your way, or you want to wear a robe of righteousness, you know? Now, according to the Bible, it says that the leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nations. That's Old Testament. What happens is when you get to heaven, if you're not well-educated or well-versed, I mean, you know that there's going to be classes. I don't think you want to keep going to classes for eternity, if you get this right quickly, I mean, you will enter into the holy city and straight to the throne of God where you always were anyway. And that's what churches are supposed to teach, that you are seated where? See, I always go back to that because we're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Here's one good piece of advice for all of you. Start acting like you're a child of royalty. Stop being a big fat crybaby. Amen. Because everything is under control. There is nothing God's throwing out there to chance and helping you stumble. That's not how he operates. You see, there's other preachers that will tell you that, well, if you do this, you're going to get that. If you do this, you're going to get that. How many know that? That's obvious. Amen, right? If I go run in the traffic right now, I'm leaving that to chance. I cannot say if I get run over, it was the devil. And if I don't, it was God. Amen. That's just not how it works. You know, you know the job is dangerous before you even chance it, right? You guys remember Super Chicken, the cartoon? Or you? Some of you old timers know. Super Chicken's motto was, you knew the job was dangerous before you took it. Well, you knew it was going to be a prospect of, man, <laughs> the, you guys know the devil hates you, right? But he's powerless to do anything unless you let him do it through yourself. It's a tricky prospect because... Everything is under control based on your sanity. Everybody say sanity. Because the definition of insanity is you doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different result. It doesn't happen that way. Hallelujah. Unless you have mental illness and multiple personality disorder. Then you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. All right. So we're all cool. Amen. You guys' axis is tilted in the right way, right? You're not bipolar. Hallelujah. All right, so I made this nice little poster for you. So sometimes when you invite me to your house, I see them in your bathroom next to the toilet. Sometimes I see them in your ice box. Sometimes I find them right in the seat where you are sitting, so you're not too sly. Amen. But we're going to talk about the effects of self-induced nonsense, and these are pretty obvious, but, you know, you got to go to the Bible. And there's a mix here of Old and New Testament, so you can kind of see where things are, where, they, where they've migrated to. Because I want you to leave here well informed. I don't like our people, you know, especially if you trust me as your pastor and spiritual father. I want you to really trust what I'm teaching because you will hear all manner of evil wickedness, silliness, folly, fantasy, weird pie in the sky stuff. How many of you like realities? 
You know, here's what it is, right? Present day truth is what our message is. You guys know what present day truth is? It's the today, here and now. It's not yesterday, it's not tomorrow, it's today. Present day truth means we bask in the glory of what Jesus did for us. 2,000 years ago is the same, because the Bible says, right, in Hebrews, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? So forever is your tomorrow. So everything's taken care of. And Jesus said in Matthew 6, don't worry about tomorrow, worry about today. And he didn't say worry in today. He said you should be taking care of business today. Just know who you are in Christ Jesus today. And where are you seated today? Yeah. Obviously sitting seated in church right now, cross them, yeah. Uh, but spiritually speaking, you're seated in a high place. And the enemy cannot get to you. Amen. The only other thing you can do if you're seated in heavenly places, you're sitting on the throne upside down. And your head is beneath the cloud line. Amen. And the enemy can whisper in the that Grand Canyon between your ears. All right, so we're looking at some scripture here today. And, I, you know, again, I want you to be well informed. The effects of self-induced nonsense, they're not bad, amen? Because th- let's put it this way. I've said this before. Energy can't be dissipated. So you know that the power of God exists in full power. It never is dissipated or diluted or watered down at all. But it can be moved off the mark, amen? So... In anything, you know, if you look at sports, if you are even an eighth or a sixteenth of an inch off somewhere along the line in basketball, baseball, bowling, tennis, whatever, you just thrown everything, all of your energies in one, one way, but if you're off even one little centimeter, it's way off at the end. Amen. And that's all the enemy's tactics are designed to do is get you to miss the mark. And the Bible says that all have fallen short of the glory of God. All of us. So we need something that doesn't make us fall short. It may, we need something that makes us hit the mark. Amen. And the only thing I know is Ephesians 2, six. You're seated in heavenly place. That was the bullseye all along to put you in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Amen. And that's it. If you move off the mark anywhere along the line, then that's on you. It's not on God and it's not on the devil. It's you. So let's look at Acts 28. Okay. So we're looking at verse 26 first, right? So let's see. Now, this is Isaiah the prophet. This is the Old Testament scripture, right? It says he's saying, go to this people and say, hearing you will hear and shall not understand. Now, Isaiah lived a long time before Jesus. And he prophesied that this was what was going to happen with God's people. So much so that Paul is writing this years and years later and referring back to the scripture. And he's talking to them. And this is what they talked about back then, about you now. And how you know, there's still people like this right now and today. Hearing you will hear and shall not understand. How many know that there's a lot of Christians out here hearing a lot of stuff, but they, don't have, they lack understanding? Uh, I don't know. I like common sense things, amen? Two plus two equals four, amen? But if you start throwing alphabets in there. Now you start confusing yourself, right? Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. So how many people hear and see the word on a daily basis yeah i know some well-intentioned people they wake up early in the morning to do devotions but they're reading this thing and if their mind isn't if you are not looking at the word from a proper vantage point you will miss the mark completely you start looking at god as yeah you're seated next to god but he's waiting to, ready to slap your face or knock you off the throne because you're not worthy we're all worthy amen and seeing you will see and not perceive, for the hearts of this people have grown dull. And that's kind of what happened to the church now. There's a lot of dullness in the church. People try and hype up. One statement I heard today is that heaven invaded earth. Okay, I've been hearing that a lot. That's just an Old Testament term for saying that heaven has visited earth. But I got news for you. Jesus is our Father prayer that was fulfilled already said on earth as it is in heaven. So heaven, technically, boys and girls, cannot invade earth. It's already here in the form of his people. But you see, less informed people who want to try and hype up some kind of an anointing and make it exciting for others to look at them as we are holy, we got it right. All the while they got it wrong because it was already there. The thing they're saying visited was already there. It's just they finally opened their eyes and felt something. Amen. If you're looking for God to touch you with an electrical current or a lightning bolt, I got news for you. You have better luck jumping a fence at Helco, climbing a pole, and grabbing a wire. Okay. 
Because these people, they're looking for excitement, not realizing it's already been there the whole time. You ever, how many of you ever been to church before? And they're trying to work themselves up into some kind of a frenzy, worshiping. <laughs> and then in the end, they're like, ah. <laughs> they work themselves up so much during the worship that when it's time for the message, they all fall asleep. They got to constantly say amen to stay awake. That's the only reason you hear a lot of amens in church because they're trying to get, keep themselves awake. That's why we give free coffee. Because most of you are dead eggs anyway when it's come time to worship, you just stand there. You know, most churches are jumping, clapping, praising the Lord. Most of you are sitting here like, well, this is nice. Yeah. You know, worship people, they're not looking for attention. They're looking to get you to pay attention to God. Amen. I don't know about you. Sometimes I come up and I lose myself in a worship. I got to remind myself, whoa, okay, hey, bro, you got a message for preach after this. So wake up. You got to get this going. But I, you know, in, I used to love worship before. I used to sit right in front of the speaker and not even worry about the, the worship would just penetrate me, and that's what I liked. I like lifting my hands and praising the Lord, and I like praising God, and I like praying in tongues and singing in tongues. While, while the worship is going in English, I'm singing in the Holy Ghost the same melody because some of you, many of you, not some of you, many of you ask me, Pastor, what is the secret to getting all these miracles? It's worship. It's worship. You got to worship the Lord, not just during music. You got to worship Him in everything you do. In everything. Yeah? When I'm praying for people, I was praying for some people today. And you know, the thing is, I worship the Lord in my car on the way to them. And not with Christian radio. I don't need that kind of music. Yeah? I can listen to ACDC, Running with the Devil, and I'm still worshiping the Lord. Because if I am running with the devil, I'm kicking him on the, in the leg, trying to trip him up anyway. <laughs> Because I don't, I, you know, a lot of Christians say, watch what you listen to. Watch who you hang out with. You, that's obvious, Captain Obvious. Yeah? If I'm going to hang out with people, I got to understand that they may be looking to take me out. You know I mean? But I'm wiser than them. You know why? I'm more evil than they ever could be. You guys know I grew up evil. Hello. So does that make them more cunning than me? No. It's, this is me allowing them to hang out with me. That's how Jesus was. You think Jesus was worried? You know all these things people, Christians say right now? Oh, you got to watch who you hang out with because you don't know. Well, Jesus hung out with the hookers. He hung out with the tax collectors who were the most evil, vile people on the earth. He hung out with murderers, uh, thieves. He hung, man, Jesus' treasurer was the biggest ripper offer of all time. Right? People say, oh, you got to watch out who you... Judas was the worst treasure of all time because almost everything went in his pocket. And then it still wasn't enough because he sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. And Jesus, you don't think Jesus knew? Well, Jesus don't care. You know why? Because his provision is not from earth. Some of you are worried about things. Oh, I got to what? Oh, what are you worried for? God is your provider, not these people. You can give everything away right now and God will just find a way to get it back to you hundredfold. And that's kind of the way God wants you to operate. Don't worry about it. And I'm not saying operate by reckless abandon. You know what I mean? Just be calculated. Be smart. You know, what you give is what you get. Amen. If you loan something out, consider it a gift, not a loan. Because when you consider it a gift, God can now bless that and bring it back to you. You know, I've seen people sow their way into perfect health from stage 4 cancer. I've seen that turn around so many times. And I don't tell them to give. I just tell them, you know, God is... God would love to give you, but you got to match God on a level of giving that gets his attention. And as soon as people do that, boom, they get blessed with divine health and healing. They never have to worry. I've seen, I seen a guy with two tumors blocking his alveoli in his lung tissue, so big like softballs. I saw the thing disappear in one day because he gave God a gift. And it wasn't even to me. He gave it to another preacher. You know, because here's the thing. Some people say, oh, they got to give you. No, 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 no. They got to give God. Wherever God tells you to give, that's what you give. And was it me? Was I disappointed? Of course. <laughs> because it was a half a million dollars he gave. But here's the thing. 
if I said, oh, wow, what about me? How many know that God will still use my gift? Because that gift is worth more than half a million dollars. God will find a way. Amen. Many of you in this room right now, I got news for you. Stop playing games with symptoms. Stop saying, oh, oh. What you feeling? Huh? What you feeling? All you got to do is walk by faith and say, no, I feel and I sense the symptom. I'm just going to try and push that back from me. And I'm here for you, right? I pray for all of you. So I'm here to reinforce that. And it's my pleasure. Don't say, oh, but you said, so I bought a renew. A new... If you like one Big Mac, where are you going? Okay, so you know where the gift is, right, of a Big Mac. So you know where to get it. So you're not going to go down to Cage Drive and say, I like one Big Mac, because they're going to tell you. Yeah, it's all locals over there. You know what they're going to tell you? Get out of here. All right, doll. Their ears are hard of hearing. You know what ears he's talking about, right? This is Old Testament versus New Testament. The ears of their heart were going to be hard of hearing. You know, the number one thing that people come to me for is, Pastor, what is God saying? And this is what I'm thinking. Bruh, you don't hear for yourself. God sound like you. You asking me to interpret? I can, but how many know that we all got to hone the gift of hearing God's voice? All of you hear God's voice. You know how I know? And I said this, uh, I didn't believe it was Sunday. Here's how you know God's voice. When somebody's coming along and, and after they entertain your life and start participating in your life and then they burn you, you always say this, oh, I knew they was going to burn me. Oh, you heard God early, but you never listen. How many of you have said that before? Oh, you see, I knew they was up to no good. But you still let them in. If you knew, you knew. If you never know, you're just acting like you knew. And you never know nothing because you're dumb. Okay. And their eyes have closed. Amen. When that means windows of opportunity are, are going to pass you by. Because self-induced nonsense, all of these things happen to you. You can't hear. You can't see. Your heart is dull. Your ears are hard of hearing. Your eyes have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears. Lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles and they will hear it. You know what that means? The Jewish people have a hard time. How many know that there's a lot of Gentiles that act like Jews and they don't get it? They don't get it. You know, stop acting like you're Jewish. You know how you act like you're Jewish? When you think the law was written for you. You guys know not even the Ten Commandments is for you, right? It's only for the Jewish people. How many Jewish people in here right now? All right, tell your friends, pack up and get out of my life. I was going to say some other stuff, but tell them beat it. Amen? Tell them get out. You know, if they come to you with that Old Testament law and say that you're a sinner, I mean, you know, it wasn't even written for you anyway. For them to even say that is stupid at best. Yeah, self-induced nonsense, on the other hand, is you knowing that God is a blessing God and you choose not to be blessed or walk in your blessing. So you can see on your notes what we wrote here, hearing and understanding is the most important thing. You can write down some other things, seeing all of these. All of these things have to do with opportunity. You guys understand opportunity? Opportunity is a funny thing because when we miss it, we get upset. But remember something. For everything that passes you by, it had to stop at your door first. Amen. How many of you can say that? Oh, if I could go back, I would do this different. That means an opportunity came your way, good or bad, and you took it. Now, many of you in here are suffering from rejection and jealousy issues because we all do. The two original things that happened in heaven and in the garden. Amen. These things kind of follow us in my... So a lot of us, we cannot stand certain people. But here's the thing. There was an opportunity to either have them in your life or not have them in your life. Like, how about a good deal? If I say, how many of you had a good deal pass you by? Yeah? That means it had to stop at your door first. See, so have you been lacking opportunities? No. You know what you're lacking, right? Guts. Courage. Courage. Some of you get more guts than brains, they say, right? So you chance things that you shouldn't, and then you got to pay a consequence later. 
Amen. That's self-induced nonsense. Amen. But here's the thing. Stop licking your wounds and crying about it. Just move on. Okay? If you can be a person that say, ha, ha, oh, boy, I screwed that one up. Not, oh, you know, the devil. Oh, blah, blah. I mean, you know, as long as you blame the devil, he's got you turned around in the wrong direction anyway. And that's where most people are. They're so busy blaming somebody else or blaming the devil that they forget that, yeah, that was just a life lesson. Amen. Some of you girls make the same mistake over and over. You pick the wrong guy. Why? Because it's not because you're bad. It's because you've been conditioned through tradition to pick the same kind of person. Most of those guys mimic your screwed up father. Hey, man, there's characteristics in your earthly father that sometimes you, you don't like, but you end up picking the same thing. If you pick opposite, if you have the characteristics of your father, and you pick opposite and you deal with them like you did, you're still wrong. You got to be Christ-like in all things, amen? How do you be Christ-like? Hmm? Keep your eyes open, your ears open, and your mouth shut. That's the hardest part as a Christian is keeping your mouth shut. Because I know I'm in a room full of politicians in here right now, ready to debate everything. That's all politicians are good for, arguing about nothing. Amen. Why do a lot of people hate Obama? Because he got things done. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, that's all I can say. He got things done and people hated him for it. Amen. You guys remember how many people lost houses back in the day? Yeah. Nobody had this. Nobody had that. There's some accomplishment. I'm not saying the man is perfect by any stretch of the imagination. But anybody who gets something done and it doesn't spend his time in the bar using county money is all right in my book. If you use your own money, that's your own business. Amen, Maurice? Yeah, you guys know what I mean. Everybody got issues. Come on, man. You got people today saying, oh, why the cops had to shoot the guy? What well, a guy shot first. What you gonna do? Throw paper at him if he's shooting gun. The other guy, he launched his car at the police. Why did the cop shoot? Well, your car becomes a deadly weapon at that point. No, I'm not saying somebody's right or wrong, but this how I many you know that there is always behavior that demands response. And that's just two things that happened this week. You know, if we were in the mainland, somebody would be protesting against the police for sure. You know, all I know is, hey, if we all love God and we love our neighbor as we love ourselves, none of these things would happen. Amen. Because why would you be at Walmart or McDonald's late at night anyway? Hallelujah. <laughs> the two most frequented places after 9 o'clock at night. Am I right or am I wrong? <laughs> And the only other places they get trouble is bars. Bars, Walmart, McDonald's. Where do you hear all the trouble happening after 9, 10 o'clock at night? One of those three places. You don't hear nothing happening at Zippy's or Ken's. Why? Because the food costs too much. You're not going to make trouble and expensive. You don't ever hear of a shooting at Roots Chris. Am I right? Why? Because it costs too much. You're trying to get in and get out as fast as you can. You're like, oh my God. $50 for one steak. I got to go home and think about this. You're not thinking about shooting somebody. <laughs> it's all where you go. Amen. Hallelujah. Everybody cool <laughs> with my analogy. Even Target gets some sense. They close 10 o'clock. Nationwide. You know how I know? Because how many hotels I've stayed at on the mainland? I go, oh my God, I can't I feel like something's coming on. I need NyQuil, DayQuil. Target is right next door. Bagas closed. Now I've got to go look for a Walmart. And it's always in the cheapest part of the city where you get all kind. When you walk in there, you walk in there and your mouth is open more than your eyes. You cannot believe the kind of people. If you don't believe me, just go online and look at the people of Walmart. Just look at their website. You like freak out? We get some of, some people in our church that dress like that anyway. All right, at this new church, I advise you guys to dress nicer. 
Because I'm going to pick you apart. Air condition. Yeah. And you cannot bring a snuggie. You cannot bring your grandma's Afghan. You guys know what I mean. All right. So you guys get that? That's the Old Testament migrated into the New Testament. And he was, Isaiah the prophet was pre-predicting and prophesying what was going to happen. And this is the church. This is the Roman church he's talking about. The Romans, well, you guys know they carried out the crucifixion of Jesus based on religion. All right. So God loves everybody equal. God has no favorites anymore. Amen. How many know that you can be God's favorite right now if you choose? Some of you don't agree. Well, anyway, all right, have fun then. Ephesians 4, let's take a look at this. Ephesians 4 and verse 18. It'll come up. Hang on. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you. I heard that. Here's another thing that self induced nonsense does for you. Okay, read that. This I say, therefore, and testify in verse 17 that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of of their mind so if there's anything wrong with the gentile church which is us we're not jewish that makes you gentile this is what's wrong is they walk in the futility of their mind you know what it's trying to tell you stop thinking so much amen the detriment to your life and ministry and whatever you call your success or prosperity is done here in the futility of your mind because if you think about it you ain't doing it amen Futility, right? Having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the... You guys get hot time right there. Because of the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Ignorance. Here's what's happening in the church. People come to the church looking at the pastor as the, the greatest thing in the world. And... I am, but <laughs> if I keep thinking like that, I'm messed up, man. Wow. Amen. We're all messed up. Amen. We all stub our toe on something. How many you stub your toe recently? Yeah, on the sun. yeah, you know what? That, that just makes us non attentive to our little toe's needs. Or your big toe in some cases. Well. <laughs> ignorance is usually us and our attempts at not paying attention well you know that if you take this word and this bible you, you, and you pay attention to it you can get way more than anybody else can get uh, i'm not you know there's big churches out there and i told you before i go on christian tv and i watch them and i listen and i'm like whoops oops because i hear the hooping and the hollering and the you know here's the thing if they get excited about something it's usually about something they don't have, but the preacher said they can have. But the opposite is true. They already have it. They just don't know they have it because they're just running with a traditional statement. We're going to slay the devil. We're going to get the devil. And the devil's going to return everything he stole. Kind of hard for somebody who was crucified next to Jesus to take all the stuff in the world when he's hanging on a cross. Okay, think about it. What hands were free? <laughs> now, I'm a common sense preacher. Amen. I know that's the devil because of what he says to Jesus. Man, he, he's always the supposition. If you be. Oh, you know, he's hanging over there. Ah, hallelujah. Oh, you know that he's asking for forgiveness and it ain't happening because all of them are going to pay. Everything was paid at the crosses, not just the cross. Because even the enemy had to pay. Adam had to pay. Amen. But Adam got forgiven because he realized his Savior was right next to him. Um, hallelujah. Does that make us the smartest Christians in the world? No, we just understand a little better. So that gives us wisdom. The word wisdom has the word wise in it. How many of you are wise? Yeah. Wise ass. Anyway, all right. Most of you are. You know why? When I'm preaching, I see your head like, <laughs> I don't know what you're thinking. All right. All right. God is good. Amen. Don't be alienated from the life of God because the word kingdom is God's way of doing things. It's God's lifestyle stamped on your life. Amen. 
So alienated from God means you're doing your own thing. When you're doing your own thing, God loves you. You're forgiven, but here's the thing. Your destination, your mark is off at the end. And then you reach the end of that and you wonder, God, how come? Why would you ask God, how come? Go back to the beginning when you first had to make the decision. You probably, 99% of the time, did not consult God for the answer before you began the journey. So you don't ask God in the beginning at the impact point, And then you wonder at the end, how come you're off the mark? Hallelujah. Now, I've asked God sometimes, and he's giving me clear direction to do something. And at the end, I thought I missed the mark, but that's the way he intended it all along. Because anytime I look at something and I say, wow, Lord, it looks like I failed. And I turn around, I see all the people who weren't in it with me. And that's the Lord's way of showing me who's in and who's not. It's not that God hates them or anything, but they fall off the wagon somehow along the journey. Yeah? In fact, when Moses was headed down, okay, you guys remember he brought them out of Egypt, headed into the promised land. I mean, you know, three million of them, they say, three million exodus out, three million slaves. Here's the thing. They brought their mentality of a slave with them. And at the end, only a handful of them made it into the promised land because they kept marching around this mountain doing laps. How I many know that when you don't do what you're supposed to do for your coach, he make you run laps? Amen. <laughs> so they had to go around this mountain, yeah, a 14-mile journey. They say it took 40 years. How does that happen? You know, we can walk from here to Hakalao unless we keep going around Mauna Kea. You know what I mean? I don't know what would be 14 miles out this way, what, um, Ainaloa maybe, yeah. But no, nope, you keep taking laps around Mauna Kea. Hallelujah. That's a long way. Why? Because they wouldn't change their heart. God just wanted them to just stop bitching and moaning. That's not a bad word, guys. That's all they were good at because all they were bitching and moaning about was their lack of a destination. The lack of a destination was because they wouldn't fall into being royalty, child, or children of the Most High God, who's their king. He, they would not shake off the slavery. They even got to the point where they made Moses mad. You guys remember Moses got mad? And God said, stretch your hand out to the rock. But he whacked the rock with his staff. He wasn't supposed to do that. And therefore, even Moses didn't get to enter the promised land. Amen. So how many know that anger will stop you from your destination too? How many of you in here are a snapper? And I don't mean a red snapper, opaka paka. Let me tell you something. You are delaying your destination of prosperity. All right. Okay, let me ask again. How many snappers in the house? Snapper turtle, snap case, high five in name and say never no more. We're going to stop that. Never no more. I'm going to stop that. Because you're delaying your destination. And you know what the destination is, right? You can't be a snap case and a preacher. You can't be a snap case and a healing evangelist. You can't be a snap case and a prophet. You can't be a snap case and a teacher of the word. Because what are you going to teach? How to be a snap case? You can't do it. I know. And you know how I know? Because I was a snappy person. Amen. I was snappy. Yeah. I had, uh, my dad was an alcoholic, a raging alcoholic. You know what that left me susceptible to? Being a raging alcoholic with a bad temper working in the prison. Amen. Yeah. So I had to change. I mean, if I have to change, let me tell you something. You better change too. Yeah. I met this guy not very long ago. And he's like, hey, bro, how are you? And his face was hanging. And I remember I was the cause of that. His face hanging. hanging And not sad. I hit a nerve in his head. And it killed the nerve. And his whole face is sagging now. I mean, you know, I felt so bad. I said, Lord, can I pray for him and fix that? The Lord said, too late. But the guy, he found out that I'm serving the Lord. He's serving the Lord. He forgave me. He's like, no, brother. You hit me for good reason. I said, there is no good reason for hitting anybody. 
And he said, no, 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 bro, don't no even worry about it. Jesus get all the glory. I felt so bad. Oh, my God. I uh, know. He gave it all to Jesus, and I, was, I gave him all the lickings. Anyway, you feel bad about these things, you know. It's like, now I feel bad at the time. I was like, yeah, good for you. You deserve that. Yeah. And you know, eh. So sometimes I, I, get, and I get this headache right over here. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, I'm paying for that. <laughs> Even before church, I got a raging headache. Even right now, it's still like, Rrr. the thing is, hey, I don't make excuses. I have a job to do. I mean, you know that I signed up for this, so I got to come do this. And I got to do a good job. I can be a real snap case to the end, right? Oh, heavy. But I still come. I don't. Man, I remember my first pastor. If he even felt like he never, he didn't want to be there that night, he would just give it to one of the soldiers. Yeah, take it. I'm not coming tonight. I'm in a bad mood. I'm like, what? That means that every service I would miss because I'm in a bad mood every day, all day. I try not to show it to anybody, but you know, some people that are close, they know that I have bad days too. I have bad days and worse days. Hey Amen. But I still got to show up. You know, today, I, I really didn't want to do ministry. I'll just be honest with you. And then the first text came in this morning and then this and then other texts. And I had to go and go meet these people. And I'm like, I'm not even feeling it today. I just, you know, people are texting me, oh, Pastor Dave, I love you. I miss you. And my text wants to say, where the hell have you been? I haven't seen you in months. But I got a text back, miss you too. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> here's the thing, yeah. The first person I went and I met up with and they said, oh, my God, thank you so much. Without you, oh, my God, blah, blah, blah. They got healed right off the bat, healed. So my bad mood was like, ah, ah, whatever. Went to the next person. And I, oh, my God, thank you for coming. You know, I didn't think you would answer my text. I'm like, yeah, neither did I, but I did. <laughs> Hallelujah. And they're like, oh, boom, heal too. Like, ah, all right, I guess. It's just, uh, uh, uh. I had to be at the church over here at about 12.15. I had to meet, uh, you know, pretty well-known guy in Hilo. And he's like, oh, my God, you was three minutes late. I thought you wasn't coming. All right, then pray for him. He feels better. Like, oh, my God, I feel different. Praise the Lord. Yeah. It's still, it's that kind of day, you know. It's just you have those days, but you got to shake it off because I'm not here for me. If I was here for me, I'd stay home in the bed with a blanket over my head. Saying, rah, 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 rah. And here's what I made for a total of six people I prayed for today. I made a total sum of zero dollars. Yeah, because some people just don't have. So those of you that do give, you make up for those. So the sum total of this week, I have $43. And one of you in here gave me $40. <laughs> Well, that's the way, oh, man, sorry. And I, again, if I was in it for the money, I'd be at home under the blanket, probably drinking a bottle of vodka or something to medicate myself, yeah? Vodka and Benadryl or something, you know what I mean? But again, some days you don't have it, but here's what you do have. You have a gift from God. You have a desire to serve God. In spite of all your emotional baggage and BS, you still make it a point to say, you know what? They need you, God, so I will go because they need you. Because think about it. They're giving God all the glory, and I'm just there standing there. Yeah. And God still uses that rotten disposition. And I just smile. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Yeah. What else can you do? You just got to still show up. Amen. So six people today, six people got healed. Yeah, man. Well, I'll say five and three fourths got healed. Anyway, was, yeah. Well, some people like to hang on to their stuff because that brings them attention that they don't have from other people. Yeah, man. Because some people love attention. 
Amen. None of you, though. You guys are not attentive whore. Okay, you all good. That's what it is. The spirit of whoredoms is alive and well. If you think I'm swearing, go look it up. There's a spirit of whoredoms. Whoredoms is your emphasis on self. Yeah. And that's where the attention deficit disorder really is when you're craving attention. If you really have a need, text me and call me. I'll be there. Amen. I'll be there. In spite of how I feel about you. Anyway, it's my attempt at singing. Praise God. <laughs> you got to really love people to be in ministry, man. Yeah, otherwise, you're in it for the wrong reason. If you're in it for attention, remember something. They're going to give God all the glory. And you're not even part of it. They say, what's that guy's name? I don't know his name, but yeah, God would heal me. Amen. Yeah. Amen. All right, Isaiah 53. Let's look at this one now, verse 6. Now, this is an Old Testament scripture again. Self-induced nonsense. We all just got to be smarter about life. Amen. Hallelujah. Blah, 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 blah. How many of you enjoy what you hear here? I'm giving you straight up advice on ministry. I, remember something. Everything I talk about is about your ministry, not mine. Mine is the example. Yours is what you do with it. Amen? Because you all are gifted in some way. You don't believe me? Well, one of these Wednesdays, we'll show you all of the gifts. And I'm working on a teaching like that about all the gifts of the Spirit that you can get. First things first, how many of you love Jesus? Amen? So you're saved. How many you know that you got the next step for you is getting water baptized? All right. And that, all that is, is you dunk yourself under the water. It's like a grave, a watery grave. You go on and you die to yourself. You come back up, brand new, same flesh, same mind. But you, it's symbolic that you have raised yourself from the dead. Because if I keep you under the water, you will surely die. Amen. So it's symbolic. That's why water baptism, you die as a symbol. You go underwater. You come back up because I cannot, despite my best efforts, put you in a coffin, throw the dirt on you, and bring you back up after. So water is the symbolism. We dunk you underwater, bring you up, and you're like, yay, I'm water baptized. The next step is being baptized in the Spirit, baptized in fire, like in Acts 2. All right, being baptized. Some people get baptized in the Holy Spirit before they get water baptized, which is fine. God's not going to say, oh, no, 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 that's illegal procedure. Here's the flag. Ah. That's not, you can get baptized in the Holy Spirit. In fact, that is more real than being water baptized to me. But well, that's, you know, just take care of that. And baptized, being baptized in fire means that the evidence of that baptism is you speak with other tongues. You're able to pray in a language that the devil can't understand. The demons cannot steal your prayer request because you're praying in the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, believe it or not, is using your vocal cords to pray things you don't understand. So it's a mishmash of every language in the world that has ever existed all in one flow. So I pray in that as much as possible. I try and do it at least an hour a day if I can while I'm driving or whatever. I just pray in the Holy Ghost because it gets my brain off of other things. Like the rack of frack, rack of frack, woe is me, I hate people, but I gotta do this. All right, as long as you understand, praying in the Holy Ghost is a good thing. It's not some far fetched thing that your mind is making up because your mind has nothing to do with it. Because if I do baptism in the Holy Spirit, how many of you would need that? How many of you need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit? We can do that tonight if you want. You know, and you just pray, and in your quiet time, you just, you're going to pray, and your tongue is just going to go, and you're going to begin to see all the things that you're praying. Yep. Some of you are like, oh, that's magic. No, it's not. It's spiritual magic. No, it's just, it's just spiritual. Many of you need that, because when, I'll tell you what happened to me. As, as soon as I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, all of a sudden, I used to feel fire go through my arms. I used to feel fire through my legs, and then I would see people, and I would know that healing was for them, and I would pray for them. And that's how all of this started was my obedience to being baptized in the Holy Spirit and praying in tongues a lot. Amen. Hallelujah. It's up to you. Okay, Isaiah 53, verse 6. I'm not forcing nobody to do nothing. Amen. I never force you for be here. I never go to your house with my knife. All right. Here's a famous scripture. 
In fact, it's talking about Jesus through the whole thing. Isaiah 53 is talking about Jesus and all the things that were going to happen to him. And even in verse 5, that last line, and by his stripes we are healed. Amen. So his stripes means all the wounds he took on his back were for our healing. Amen. Then it goes into verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Okay, so if the Lord has laid all of our iniquity, and iniquity is just another word for sin. Laid the sin on Jesus. How many you know that for you to talk about sin is self-induced nonsense of his own? Right? Because did Jesus pay for it all? Did he wash away all the sin? Did he take it all away? Then we shouldn't even be talking about sin. Amen? This is my Portuguese friend. He said, all we like sheep have gone astray. Uh, hallelujah. There's a holy lady driving around town. She's kind of wacko, crackers, lose them. She has an ashtray on her dashboard. Yeah, right on her dashboard, she got an ashtray. I thought we banned ashtrays. I don't know. I saw this and I was like, holy Christmas. Look at this. She is all about the environment. She's not going to flick her cigarettes outside. She got an ashtray right on her dash. I was thinking, what a conscious person of being green. Anyway, smoking green that I've turned brown. Because anyway. cars don't come with ashtray anymore. You're going to flick them in your box. You're going to clog up your USB port. <laughs> I just thought that that was kind of strange. It was a Honda Accord. I was like, all of these Honda people, there's something wrong. I just played. These guys all drive Honda. <laughs> Time to get a Nissan. Anyway. Uh, nah, nah, nah. I'm just playing. Well, this lady is just, I don't know, what is the proper term for them? Well, lose them. Hawaii, we just call them, oh, <laughs> lose them. Anyway, we make the sound of lose them. <laughs> Get some people out there, though, huh? Hey, Amen. You guys all good? You all good? All right. So what do you think this one is? All we, like sheep, have gone astray. Astray. We have turned everyone to his, look at those words there. <laughs> you guys see that? We have turned everyone to, so what is the real nonsense in this scripture then? Some of you already turned the answer out in your head, but you shameful say them out loud in case you're wrong. It's this, go in your own way, like Fleetwood Mac's song. You cannot go your own way. Can you tell I was a music fan? Anyway. You cannot do things your own way. That's you being God. How I many know that God wants you to have a say in everything, but He would like to participate in that by giving you proper direction. Amen? Because everything is about impact and destination. So if you want to be at the right destination, you better consult the person that is at the point of impact in all things. Amen? Hallelujah. Amen. I get people all the time come to me like, Pastor, I think I found Mr. Right. Okay. Amen. I am. For you, that's your business. Who you end up with is your business. Amen. So, oh, Pastor, I think I found him. I sowed a seed and I found him. I said, well, hopefully <laughs> that you seed sowing had patience involved with it because sometimes people sow on Sunday and try and reap their own on Monday. I don't know. The fastest growing seeds I ever saw was Chia Pets. Yeah, man. Like that even that takes a little while. These people that pass I so much seen on Sunday. He Mr. Wright showed up on Monday. And then I asked him, is he Mr. Right off the mark or right of center or what? But they're like, no, no, no. And then after a while you see. When you rush into anything, it's not good. Amen. Hallelujah. Nothing good ever happens when you rush things. Amen. How are you going to make stew in five minutes? The meat going to be tough. Even a pressure cooker takes 45 minutes. At least. How are you going to make poi? Just smash them. No, can. Take time. And not everybody's hand can be in the poi. Okay. Because some people don't wash good. 
You know, Hawaiians had a theory, right? And here's a life lesson for many of you. You guys know that lomi salmon is not an ancient Hawaiian food, right? You know, see the salmon swimming upstream of Wailuku, yeah? I say this from time to time because people are like, what? These were all the Hawaiians, went to the Pacific Northwest, they went to work, never even have tomatoes on the hokulea. <laughs> never have onions either. And sure never have ice cubes. You remember in fourth grade public school, you had to learn Hawaiiana, eh? So the, everybody's saying, oh, we want to make a luau with Kapilani. We want to make a luau for our fourth grade project. So everybody's doing that. And then I was researching because my job was low me salmon. And I was like, okay, you had to do a report with what you made. So I did the report and I found out before the days of Google... You really had to go dig in the books to go find out. And I found out that there were like Hawaiians that went to the Pacific Northwest to go and learn how to fish. And they migrated out. And the fish of choice was in Manini. Was salmon. Ah, and where is salmon found, boys and girls? In cold climates, right? Because they got to swim upstream. And you, you ever saw one grizzly bear by boiling pots? Ah, uh, no. Because <laughs> I confirmed this with a Hawaiian um, kupuna, and this person told me, no be low, low, eh? Because she was telling a story. She was an elderly woman, and she was saying, you know, my grandpa guys, they all went Pacific, nowhere, and that was the fish, and they like eat raw fish, but the salmon, no more flavor when raw. So they had to put onions that they found in green onion, yeah, and tomato. All of the things in lomi salmon that not found in Hawaii. <laughs> when I did my report, everybody got angry. They said, no, we eat that at every Hawaiian party. That's Hawaiian food. <laughs> so when this kupuna lady told me, this tutu told me, Tell them no be lolo. What them stupid mobera maki baby time. No more salmon Hawaii. No more tomatoes Hawaii. No more even green onion Hawaii. No, let alone white onion. Maui onion, not even from Maui. <laughs> so the next time you eating lomi salmon. Lomi is just a description of how they mixed it. Okay, so how many of you learned something tonight? That you, okay. No more salmon in Wailuku River. Because if get salmon, would have grizzly bears. If you see one grizzly bear, Wailuku is just on Portuguese with on tan. He had plenty of hair on his back. Or as his sister. Anyway. I learned that in fourth grade. You know, I even stumped my uncles and aunties when I told them, you know, Lomi Sam is not from Hawaii. They're like, what? No, that is our ancient Oh, my God. I like meet the Hawaiian that was towing the salmon from Polynesia all the way to Hawaii. Anyway, no more. Because salmon is a cold water fish. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> See, you learn things when you pay attention. So now you can all go stump your friends. <laughs> I don't know. Unless you was willing for what Mauna Kea gets snow for putting it. Anyway, hallelujah. Maybe they found green onion and onion up Mauna Kea when they was getting the ice. And the salmon would swim up there. <laughs> okay. Just some trivia for you. Some of you are very entertained by that. Remember where I grew up? You're supposed to be more smart than me. Anyway. All right. Ashtray. Okay. He has good stubbornness. He has not stubbornness. That's being hard-headed, right? 
Yeah. How? Oh, How? Oh. You're stubborn. How long are you going to be stubborn and not be blessed and then keep sowing seeds to be blessed, but you're a jackass? It's not good to be a jackass and try and be successful. It does not work. All right. Hallelujah. The next one is Romans 3, verse 13 and 14, right? So I want you all to be the most informed people so we all learn about Lomi Simon tonight. Praise the Lord. <laughs> yep, 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 yep. All right. Where are we? 13 and 14. Okay, right here. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. You know what an asp is? It's a snake. Okay. Because some of you are, what is one ass? Because this has happened before in this church. That's the church. Describe what one ass is. If my eyebrows go up when you ask the question, you're probably describing yourself. Anyway, all right. All it is is crooked speech. You see it on your notes, right? Crooked speech. You know, people whose mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. You meet people like that in the Christian world. Like, ah, you know, I don't believe the kind. <laughs> How many of you have witnessed miracles in this church, even in your own life? Then there's no bitterness in you, right? Because you've seen the hand of God moving in your own life. And for some of you, God got to move many times to get you where you need to go. Amen. Despite your best efforts to fail, God is still prospering you. All right. How many of you are more successful now than you've ever been? Everybody's hand better go up because at least you got Jesus over you. Amen. Because remember, in the end, or like the famous say, at the end of the day, it's all about Jesus. That's all I'm here for is to witness to the power of God. Amen. The power of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit, I love it when he migrates through your life because I see things happen for you. Amen. Hallelujah. I know some people in our ministry, despite their best efforts not to work, God keep giving them jobs. <laughs> hey, how come you're laughing the most? Is that hitting your house a lot? Anyway. How many of you don't want to work, but you got to work? Come on, be honest, right? All right. You know what I used to think when I was at work about not working? My greatest hobby at work was thinking, how can I not work at this job because that I hate and I wish I wasn't here? God gave me the perfect job, ministry. You know why? Because I don't know what's going to happen. You know, when I went to paramedic school, this is what shocked me, was that I was a student, so my job was to sit in the back of the rig and not know what's going on on the radio. They just say, oh, we have a call. Let's go. And I'd be like, huh? All right. Jump in the back of the rig and we're going. And I don't know what's going to happen when I get there. I start sweating already. Like, oh, my God, what am I going to see? And sometimes I would get very shocked at seeing somebody's cranium rolling around on the highway. And they tell me, hey, you're the student. Pick it up. And then I pick them up and get yelled at by the cops to leave it alone. Tricks. Yeah, everyone likes to play jokes. That's the way it goes, right? So, hallelujah. I used to think to myself, how can I do this and parlay this into a career forever? And something came to me. You're just here temporarily to learn something along the journey. And now, you know what all of those things taught me? Was to value human life. Amen. Because life is short. How many of you can remember 40 years ago? Oh, you old. But God is blessing you. Amen. He's making you young again. You know that laughter is the best medicine. So you come to this church. My job, boys and girls, is to make you laugh. While teaching you the word. Because if laughter is the best medicine, if I'm not making you laugh, I'm making you sick. Because some of you in here, you need to boss laugh. You know, I boss laugh. You guys know this boss laugh. It's not the one that stopped at the bus stop. <laughs> Some of you need to laugh because you're too uptight. You take yourself too serious. Your life is too serious. Amen. So if I can make you laugh, then I'm keeping you healthy because I'm just giving you medicine. You ever go to a church where you didn't laugh the whole time? 
you felt more sick when you left. And the thing is, you know, you know what I find? Because I was in churches like that. There was no funny business in there. Everything was about religion and the law and death and hell and the devil. And you leave there and everybody says, what a great service. And I'm thinking to myself, what the heck is going on? Is this the mental hospital over here? Everybody think that was great? I don't think that was great. That was irritating. So I try and make it an enlightening, humorous kind of experience for you. If you don't laugh. Then go home, take a plunger, put them on your face, and pump ten times. Because we got to get something out of your head. That bugger is clogged up. You got to unclog that head of yours. You get too much seriousness going on. You know what is funny? Yeah? Teenagers, yeah? they come in here, they laugh, laugh. And then sometimes when everybody laughing, they're all serious. Like, and you know what goes through my mind? I know they get some boy or girl on their mind right now. They're thinking. Plunger. When you're young, that's all you think about. Like, oh, oh, oh. When you get old. Ha, ha, ha. God is good. Amen. I used to do youth ministry. I was an associate youth pastor. I was a pastor of a youth for a little while. And one thing I found out is these kids get issues. All they think about is sex, drugs, and playing. Hormones. Anyway. Food was fought on the list. Yeah. Hallelujah. These kids. You know, we used to go to the food bank and pick up all the snacks for them, have youth meeting, right? all the snacks. And they all, you know what the number one prayer request for kids is? Getting rid of zits. Yeah, getting rid of zits or mending their broken hearts. And the thing is, they stuff in their face with all the snacks and wondering why they get zits. So one time I went to the food bank and they had clear seal. Cases of clear seal. So I got them all. And the guy I was with said, how come you buy that? Because these kids, they're going to all the kind, create a face, kind of lava pizza face, kind of bust up. So I busted out the clear seal. And you know what they thought? That was the greatest thing ever. They all was washing their face. I said, hey, one life lesson. You don't can wash your face and not wash your teeth. Because some of you is raging. Better take care. How are you going to kiss somebody? Your breath going to perm their hair. <laughs> so the next time I brought mouthwash. Because believe it or not, the food bank has mouthwash sometimes. And they have toothbrush, toothpaste, dental floss. So we had some of the most hygienic kids you ever met. I said, now you're preparing for success. Amen. Yeah, man. Now I get adults in my ministry, not even brush and floss. Anyway. You better work on your game. Amen. Ask Marcy. She get the scrubs on for a reason. She like look in your mouth. She like smell your breath right now. She can tell you what's going on in your mouth just by smelling you. You know, I catch her. Sometimes she hug me. Pass on. What? She don't even know she do that. She's like, she's not smelling my skin. She's smelling my breath. I know it. So for Marcy, I'm over there. Getting the rope. All right, frontier medicine. We cannot all use pliers. Amen. Jeremiah 17, 9, boys and girls. <laughs> it's good. All right, check this out. Their heart, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Here's the thing. Before you saved, and that's what I put on there, it's the, your heart is deceptive if not saved. You know, one thing about your friends and family, they don't know what you've experienced with God. Don't expect them to know. How many of you try to evangelize your friends and family, tell them about church, how good it was, and they look at you like, 
They don't know what you experience. They have no clue. Like I told you before, tell them no come. As soon as you tell them no come, they like come. That's the way the human condition is. You tell them something, they like do the opposite. You ever told somebody, oh, this cake, no good. They're like, why? What wrong? Well, let me try. Amen? So you know already, you tell somebody no, they like do them. Amen? Tell them, no jump off the cliff. Why? Not too far. If, I, if something happens, you rescue me, eh? and then you jump off. I had some real dumb friends like that. I told my friend one time, my bike, because my bike, I was working on my bike, because I used to steal a lot of bikes. So, <laughs> not. I had this bike, and every so often, because the fork where it attaches to the tires, the screw would come loose sometimes. So I told my friend, okay, hey, no ride the bike, okay, don't, because I'll tell you what, I got to change these first, and I got to pound this in because it's kind of crooked, so it's already, it's wearing wrong. So I told him, no ride, try to ride the bike until, I, and I went. My dad took me, and we went, and we are going to look for some new nuts and bolts, right, with washers, and he was going to help me bend it to make it straight. I came home. My friend was on the side bleeding with all kind of bandages all over his body. I told him, what the heck happened to you? You fell in a meat grinder or what? And he said, bah, I didn't ride your bike. I told him, why you ride the bike for? I said, what happened? He said, I was riding, I was riding the bike. And he was crying like, <laughs> I should have went, listen. I said, wow, what happened? He said, I was going down over here. And all of a sudden, the tire came off. And the fork went hit the, hit the curb, and I went, and I went fly on the curbage, and I went get all scurbage. <laughs> I told him, why you never just wait till I fix the bike? I always lend you my bike. He said, oh, I should have went listen. And I was looking at his bandages, and it wasn't like fresh gauze. It was ace bandage with scotch tape, because he couldn't find the metal, and had blood coming through the thing, you know, and... I had to help my friend repair himself with Bactine because Bactine was the cure-all for everything. You get so I... <laughs> Your leg sore. <laughs> you like hear people sing opera, just shoot Bactine all over their open cuts. I was helping this guy. I was like, bro, you shouldn't do that. And he's like... <laughs> Not even one month later, his bike was lying in the thing. And he told me, hey, try to ride my bike because flat the tire. I said, how come? He said, I don't know, get one leak or something. And you guys know where Mr. K's recycling is now. Yeah, that was a service station back in the day. So I was thinking, oh, the tire flat. I'm going to help my friend out. So I rode the, I didn't ride, I walked the bike all the way from Lanakila Housing down there. I put air in the tire. And I was like, okay. Yeah, can't ride. The tire was flat. I'm just going to ride them. I rode the bike halfway through the intersection in front of a cop. The sidewall, I didn't know, had a bubble in a tube. And it went, pa, pa, like a gunshot. And I saw the cop come out of the car, fall out with his seatbelt on, upside down, in the middle of the intersection, trying to undo himself and unholster his gun. And I looked at the flat tire, and I, I walked. I said, what happened, officer? I knew what happened. The thing exploded right there. Pah, like a gunshot. You should have seen this guy upside down with his head by the, by the road. Trying to unlatch the seatbelt. I was like, did I do that? <laughs> and he's like, you heard that, boy. You heard that. And where that gunshot came from? Where that thing came from? Because Ekomomai is right there, and at that time was pretty notorious over there. And he's like, yeah, I think he's in the apartment soon. He went inside, and he was calling for backup, and I saw all these cops coming down. And walking my bike back up the hill, it was my friend's bike that he told me not to ride. Oops. Then I threw the bike in my friend's yard. Then he came home, he said, oh, he just bought a pump for his bike. And I'm over there, how come? You tire flat. <laughs> then he's pumping and pumping and wouldn't. I said, oh, maybe the tube went blow. <laughs> he 
He said, then he took off the tie and he looked. Wow, all shredded in here. Oh, bro, how you know? God talked to you. Evidently, God was talking to me a long time in my life. <laughs> Blew out his tube. Then he had to go back to the bike shop, go get one tube. And then he came back and I helped him fix it. I go, now your tire good. You know what? I pump them up for you. <laughs> I told him, more fast if we go down the kind, eh? down the service station. He said, nah, right here. <laughs> so me and him took turns sweating and then we were both riding bikes after that. Amen. The moral of the story is people will do the opposite of what you tell them to do. Perfect example. Amen. Hallelujah. You guys know, right? I remember before we used to play baseball in Lanakila Park. They had a backstop, so if you hit it that way, you would hit the house, which our house was in the direct line of left field. So my dad always said, turn the other way, come over here and hit down towards the basketball court. So sometimes we put them over the building into the barbed wire fence. Yeah? One time we sent this fat girl. She said, I'll go get him. Has barbed wire all around the top, but there's one part of the fence was a little bit higher. And she said, I get them. She said, oh, we said, not supposed to. Just leave them. One of us came. She said, no, I got them, I got them, I got them. So she went. She came back, and her shirt was missing. And she was holding her big fat boobies like this. She said, one of you effers better go over there and get the ball and get my shirt off the fence. And was like, what happened? Had the opening. She go, shut up. <laughs> we went. She had climbed up, but her shirt got stuck on the other side. And she didn't want to let go of her boobies and reach on the inch and get her shirt under the fence. She just came all the way to the park to yell and swear at all of us to go over there and get the ball and her shirt. And she kept throwing kicks at us. Go, hurry up. Yeah, yeah, we're going. And all of us young boys like, woo-hoo, woo-hoo. It's like, shut up. And she said, when I get my shirt on, you guys all going to get cracks. And my friend was like, oh, you get chichis on your back too? You got to cover those. <laughs> oh, boy. He got dirty, dirty licking from her. Dirty licking. I never seen one guy get so beat up in my whole life. Lucky I could run fast because she was coming after me too. It was like the running of the bulls in Pamplona. And sure enough, she tried to get on them, but her shirt was too, <laughs> too close to the bottom of the bob not the not in the bob wire, but just a chain link grabbed her shirt and pulled it right off. She's like, oh my God, she was whipping the ball at everybody. You see the kind of crazy stuff happening in my life. Anyway, as for your enjoyment today, amen. I won't say her name because she's a real live breathing person who's a raging lesbian now and she will still kill me right now if she find out. When we were growing up, we were like 12 years old. She, to us, she looked like she was 6'10". Well, I just ran into her at the doctor's office now and she go, Hey, Timothy Wong. I heard the voice and I was like, oh my God, that's somebody from my parents. And I turn around and she's like five six. So I was like, "Oh, it's just you. Lucky you never grow, no." <laughs> she go, "What you doing now?" I'm not a doctor like you. Yeah, and there's these people that's from your past. Even sometimes you're like, mm-hmm. <laughs> she's still working the mullet from ten and ten years old. She had a mullet from ten and ten years old, man, just rocking Billy Ray Cyrus before he was Billy Ray Cyrus. I'm like, oh, sis, don't still get the Billy Ray working. And she shook my hand like a man. Okay, bro, I see you after. I'm thinking to myself, way after, I hope. <laughs> my hand was throbbing. Like she's five, six, but she still shake hands like a man. Like, oh, my God, he broke my wrist at the doctor. <laughs> Hey, man, some people still yet. I remember this guy. Okay, I'll tell you, this, you guys like these stories, I know. I have told this story before, but this guy, his name was Scotty. He was on punk. Punk, punk, punk. We used to call him punk rock before punk rock was vogue. He was a real punk. He used to like bullying us, taking our money, taking all that stuff. And we all went to Spencer Park camping one time. And he was acting up, acting 
punky with us. He thought I went like his girlfriend. He was acting up. And my friend brought this bottle of Nair. And we're like, ah, this thing don't really work. I don't think. Well, we put him on Scotty's eyebrows when he was sleeping because he sleep hard. You know, kind of Hawaiian Portuguese sleeping. You know, kind of. <laughs> They're telling you stories and trying to sleep at the same time. And so we put the nair on his eyebrows. And we never think nothing. We're like, ah, the thing not working. We did flashlights because he's sleeping hard. We're like, ah, you blah, blah, blah. Like shining a light. Ah, this thing don't even work. So we went to sleep. Woke up the next day and thinking nothing. So you remember in the old days, no more mirrors spent so far. Because everybody broke the mirrors or steal them. I don't know what they're going to do with that kind of mirror. It's jail kind of mirror. Well, he went to the thing, washed his face. And we're all eat, eating breakfast. And he came and all of a sudden, whoa. Whoa. It's the only word you can say. Whoa. <laughs> it was like patchy, you know. Almost all of it gone. But there was like little funky little patches there. And like. And the summer fund leaders were in shock because they knew somebody did it, but they didn't want to say nothing. They were just looking at each other like, oh, my God. This was OMG before OMG was spelled by initials. And they were looking at us and like, what you guys do? Don't you guys what rotten, bloody kids? What the heck is wrong with you guys? And we're all looking and everybody's in shock because he's a punchy, punchy, weird guy. In fact, he's probably still in prison right now. Anyway. And all of us were like trying our best throughout the day not to say anything, not to even look at him, not laugh. Just, we were there for seven days. You know how I, that was the first night? We had to go like a whole week without saying one thing. Oh my God. And this is what, a true story, okay? So we get back to Hilo and we all go home and everybody's like, oh God, don't say nothing. And then he came to my house, and he's like, eh, look what you did, huh? You did this to me, huh? And my father came to the door and said, what the hell happened to you? <laughs> you look like you got in a you know, fight with the road, and the road won. And he's like, oh, Mr. Wah, I just was checking if he did this to me. And my, my dad told him, get the hell out of here. My kids don't do stupid stuff like that. <laughs> One credit for my father. That I, <laughs> he, he, he went. Then after he's like, what you did to that kid? <laughs> I said, no, so-and-so brought an air and and I told him, yeah, we'll go put him on his eyebrows because he's a punk. And my, my dad said, good, he deserved that. You do something stupid, guess what? You're going to match him. Because I'm going to put him on yours. <laughs> this guy was going all around asking her and nobody would spill. Finally, he had to just shave off the rest because... He was looking like a leper. Anyway, he shaved them all off, so he looked surprised the whole week. Like. <laughs> True story. Anyway, and my mother, my mother, because I asked my mom, I said, what does Nair do? She goes, you want to find out? No. It removes hair. It's a debilitator. It takes away hair. I was like, you mean going to take them all away? And that's how it all started, because I've suggested that. So watch what you suggest. It may come to pass. The enemy will present that opportunity to you. What if I cheat on my text? I'm going to have it, and then they have I cheat on my text, and then audit. Mm. Hallelujah. Watch when you play with Nair, especially if you're a boy. That news for you. It'll work if you leave it on long enough. Amen. So the guy never did find out who was. And then one time, I was working at the jail, and he came in, and now I'm 6'2", and I'm like 250 pounds, I was powerlifting, I was really big, and he came in, and he's still 5'4". <laughs> when he was 5'4", I was 4'4", four four, you know what I mean? Now he came in, he said, I act a punk, I told him, bro, no even. He's like, why, why, why? I said, I'm not a boy anymore. I will make a pretzel out of you. <laughs> Well, then, you know, some guys, they just never change. Never change. How about you? Have you changed? Have you changed today? Because I know who you was yesterday. 
Hope you change for today. Amen. All right. So, again, who can know it, right? The heart is, you know, when I was a kid, I was, I was smart because I read a lot. But the thing is, I was deceptively evil. <laughs> I used to like to try different things, you know. Try to, I would read up on things and think, oh, I should do this. Mm. We used to make bombs after New Year's. You guys remember New Year's Day? You take all the un, unpopped duck brand and you take all the paper off and you make bombs. Thank God none of them blew up in our face. Amen. Because we're over there packing them. That thing could have gone off at any time. I remember making bombs out of big fountains and just blowing them and nothing left. We couldn't find one piece. I'm like, wow, we can go to Iraq. No, we wasn't even thinking. I was like, wow, make one more. We would blow the cover, the manhole covers off the, the gutters and boom, that thing be in the air. And you know, those things are like 80, 90, 100 pounds. But dang, but dang, and we're all laughing. Ah! Yeah, and little girls riding their bike past the thing land. And we're laughing. Ah! And they're like, stupid. And they pedal away and show your finger. Aren't you seven? Anyway, that was the old days, Lanakila housing. All right, you guys like that? Okay, 1 Corinthians. <laughs> All right, verse 14. Here's another thing. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. That's why it's nonsense, right? You can't tell anybody about spiritual things if they don't know the Spirit. If they don't know God. How are you going to tell them? All you can do, again, is tell them, yeah, at this place, that pastor guy, kind of mental, you know, his stories. You better come listen. Yeah. Some people say our church is more like a comedy club. I don't know. There's some comedy here. I don't know. But you guys learn, right? You learn something, right? So again, you know, the last one is a deceptive part. This one is lacking intellect to change because you know God. Are you changing? Okay. Here's how people change. They change based on you changing. They follow God as you follow God because people always observe other people. If you're walking around like you're mad at the whole world, they're not going to follow you. Yes. But if you're happy and laughing all the time, they want to be around you. They want to hang out with you. Some of you guys throw plenty of parties. You know how I know? I'm not invited. But I hear about it on Facebook or Instagram. or I see pictures of all your food and I'm like, yeah. <sighs> No, I'm not, I'm not like that. Because remember, you invite me to yours and I go, somebody find out that I never go to theirs. Oh, my God. Everybody all mad because I never go. So I don't even post pictures about where I go, what I eat, because all of you like, yeah. So I'm looking out for everybody's peelings. I am watching your peelings. Was this... Unfortunately, that's how it is. If I pick one, I got to pick all. And I cannot be every place at the same time. So somebody going to feel slighted. I learned this a long time ago. I got invited to like five parties. I went to four. The fifth one, I ran out of time. When I went there, the lights was all off. I said, oh, well. They go, I was all mad. They shut the party down because I never come. And they didn't blame me. I said, I came. The lights was off. They go, yeah, right. Oh my God! Next time I'm gonna I'm gonna bang my car into your porch so you knew I came. There's people there. People are like that. They get so rejected. Oh my God! Calm down, man. Now if you invited me to a restaurant, wow, that's a different story. Nah, I try and go, but you know nowadays I uh, just go home, watch sports center, more easy, and pray for your party. Yeah. There was one time people invited me to a party and they never think I was coming. They busted out lines and weed and alcohol and everything. And then I showed up and I was like, hey. And they're like, Woof, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> how are you going to hide white powder on your nose? Like, like oh my God. <laughs> so when I look at them, I just say, oh, wow, you guys, you never share. 
They go, why, Pastor? He said, okay. <laughs> no, but you never share anyway because I can sell them and make money instead of collecting offering at church. In fact, give me a stash bag right now. Uh, anyway, people are like that, you know. If you show up, they don't know you coming. No, they're surprised. Amen. Yeah, yeah. you guys all good? All right, so self-induced nonsense, if you understand what it is. It's just us and our futile attempt at trying to be holy. It ain't happening. Either you are holy in your heart or you're not. You're holy in your head. Something like that. All right, you all happy?